Hello and welcome to Hard Copy. I'm Terry Ikumi. Now this week we focus on two very important areas as far as the COVID-19 is concerned, enforcement of the lockdown and surviving the virus. I'll be speaking to two guests. My first guest, Olua Shion Oshobi, is a COVID-19 survivor who courageously shared her experience on Twitter. It was quite a compelling read and we needed to speak with her further. Now, from the confusion she felt at the onset when she was first diagnosed to the uncertainty that followed and her joy when it was all over, we'll find out all that. Tonight on Hard Copy, Olua Shun, or Survivor, as she would like to be called, shares her story with us and gives a little more of her perspective on whether or not citizens understand the seriousness of the disease. Olua Shun, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us and welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to first of all say that it's uh, congratulate you at least for defeating this virus and uh, secondly for coming forward to share your story. Uh, I say that because we understand that there could be some form of stigmatization of persons who have uh, survived this virus or been diagnosed with it. Were you not worried about stigmatization? Um, I'm going to be honest, I was a bit worried about it because COVID-19 is a very new issue and, you know, you don't want your name out there with such a virus, you know. So I was a bit, a bit very worried. Um, but then again, I realized it, I had like a social responsibility to enlighten people um, about the virus, the symptoms and my recovery process because I had read lots of comments that it was false. Um, it was propaganda from government to embezzle funds. I read so many things and I felt the need, you know, to share you know the reality of the situation and also to encourage them not to stigmatize those who tested positive okay talk to us about your experience uh would like to know first of all from when you uh returned from your trip outside the country and the possibility of you contracting that virus take us through that process did it ever cross your mind that you would be you could possibly have contracted that virus at the time at no point did i see myself contracting not because i'm superhuman or something but because you know, I took every precautionary measure, washing my hands, you know, sanitizing, um, you know, dusting surfaces, cleaning them properly. I did everything I could. Um, but then again, I was in a place where I had to meet people. I had to be at um, eye level events with a lot of people. So, um, and also I had to take the tube, public transportation in the UK. So there's, you know, I tried everything humanly possible not to contract it, but I did. And when I did, um, I didn't even know at the time I was, I felt ill, but I knew the most important thing for me to do was to self-isolate and to get tested, which I did. Um, and when I found that I was positive, you know, I was taken to the isolation center in Lagos where I was um, treated and cared for. And again, it was a very tough, you know, situation there because I had to take a lot of medication. I was reacting to the medication at some point. But I knew I had to take them for the purpose of my own health, and I did. I did take them, and you know, I survived. Uh, at what point did you so did you start to suspect that you had this virus? Um, again, I wasn't sure I had the virus, but I knew I was unwell. And it was on the day I returned into the country on my flight, I started having symptoms of fever. I was hot, I was cold, and I was sweating at the same time. So when I arrived at the at the um, airport. You know, I was happy to see health care workers there to test, you know, to take, you know, my temperature to check if everything was okay. And then they flagged it that my temperature was high and asked me to step aside, which I did. But a few minutes after they, you know, we did the check again and said, oh, I'm fine, I'm good to go. So I thought maybe I was overthinking it. But then I got home and, you know, it still wasn't any better. And I knew I had to be tested. And when I, I got tested... Within 24 hours, I was told, you know, I was positive. From your, from your story on Twitter, it would seem that you uh, spent quite a lot of time calling the NCDC and it uh, seemed like there was delayed response. Tell us about your experience calling the help numbers that were provided by the NCDC. Were they as swift as you had hoped? Um, so I did reach out to NCDC and it was, you know, very easy. However, to get tested was the battle. So, you know, I was told, oh, they will come now, they will come, they are coming, they are coming. I kept waiting. My parents were anxious because they were like, you know, let's take you somewhere to get tested. Um, but I had to, you know, stay at home and just wait 
for the healthcare workers to come and test me at home. So it was a bit tough. And even my friend had to go on Twitter at some point, you know, to try to get the attention to test me. So how long did it take from when you called for their attention to when they eventually came for the testing? Um, it was, I think, 24 hours. Yeah. At that time, what and kind of symptoms were you showing? Over 24 hours. Over 24 hours. At that time, what kind of symptoms were you showing? Um, I was coughing. I had high fever, loss of appetite, dizziness, and all of that. Okay, so when you got to the isolation t center, tell us about your experience there. Um, I mean, I got there. I was the only person, so I was like, oh, my God. Um, I'm going to be lonely here. Like, will I be able to get help as much as I want? Um, but, you know, the healthcare workers gave me medication, gave me food. We're checking my temperature morning, afternoon, evening, just to ensure that um, my, you know, lungs were not collapsing or I was not having shortness of breath. So they really did help me to, to get better. Oh, um, beyond that, I think one, one of your experiences which you put on Twitter was uh, the attitude of the nurse there. Could you talk to us about that? Um, so when I first got to the center, um, you know, I didn't get the best reception from the healthcare workers. And I was not really pleased about that because I was kept in the ambulance for two hours. Um, and I felt that, you know, the priority should be you know, getting me to, to my space and, you know, just helping me rest and get started on the treatment. Um, but, you know, I wasn't treated very, very nicely. Um, and, you know, I wanted to say that out there so that for subsequent cases, they can be handled much better. So I'd like us to talk about the state of the isolation center when you got there. And just to be clear, was it the Yaba Infectious Disease Center that you were taken to? Yes, I was taken to the Yaba um, um, IDH. So what state did you find it in? It was good. Um, well painted. Um, looks very neat, very clean. So I was very comfortable staying in there. So it, it, it was very good. It was in good condition. Let, let's talk about the synergy now. What did you notice uh, was the synergy between the Lagos State Government and the NCDC? Because you talked about having to repeat your story over and over again, every now and then, uh, every time an official came to you, uh, seemed like there was some <laughs> lack of data sharing somewhere. Yes. So when I got to the center, you know, um, the nurses kept asking me the same question. NCDC had asked me and the Lagos State Ministry of Health had asked me as well. So I was just a bit, you know, frustrated that you're collecting the same data I have provided over and over again. So it definitely showed that, you know, there was a bit of lack of synergy between both parties. Um, but which is a feedback I have given to them, you know, to help improve their system. So once one person collects data, you know, you can carefully share it with other partners across board so that uh, patients don't have to tell their experience over and over again. Uh, I'd like to hear your experience firsthand, especially as it concerns the illness itself. Some people imagine that it could be like the common cold. Uh, other survivors have said it was like uh, a glass uh, pieces of glass in their lungs. How was it for you? Um, for me, it was it was really tough because I was coughing, I was sneezing, I had high fever, I was dizzy, I had loss of appetite, I was I had diarrhea, I was vomiting, I was I was doing a whole lot at the same time. So it was very tough for me, um, and it's an experience you know I'd like to recount again because you know it just takes me back to that moment where I'm trying to forget and just move on. But it was a very difficult situation to be in for me. And how long did these symptoms last? Ah, uh, that's a tough question. Um, I would say about 10 days. Were you in pains very much? I was in pain. Um, there were times when I was having back pain. Um, my stomach felt like something was moving from my stomach to my throat and you know, it was painful, and I did relate all of that to the medical practitioners who were very kind, you know, to give me medication to address all of my, you know, medical situation at the time. I can't even begin to imagine that kind of pain. Well, I've had some illnesses myself, but this I, I've never had, so it's hard to understand the kind of pain you went through. What I want to know from you is, what kept you going? Um, God, my family, my friends... The, the zeal to fight, the one to leave, all of those kept me going, really. Uh, nice. And then there was the long wait to be discharged after you first tested negative. How did you handle that? 
you know, I just had a conversation with the healthcare workers um, to, you know, provide factual information about the situation and, you know, we're able to speak about it and resolve it and I was discharged um, uh, um, three days after. Now, you, uh, you have lived this experience and um, it's such that till now we still have people who don't believe that this disease exists or the virus exists. Yeah. What would you say to people like that? If you can see me, then it exists. Um, I mean, we just need to self-isolate and stay at home and practice good hygiene at this point because we cannot have this pandemic run Nigeria because it's it's a lot to handle. Um, and I can tell you from the first-hand experience, it would kick your system. And for those who have underlining um, health conditions, it's even tougher for you to fight and survive. So all I can say is please stay at home. Please, you know, um, practice social distancing. Let's sort of stop the spread. That's the only thing we can do right now. But let's emphasize more on this stay at home thing. And um, I, I, from your conversation or from what you posted on Twitter earlier, you did say that when you observed that you had to isolate yourself at home. Uh, yeah. Talk around isolation, self isolation, and um, staying at home to prevent the spread. So can you say that again? Could you talk around? staying at home to prevent the spread and self-isolation if you suspect that you've been infected or you've been in contact with, a, with an infected person? Yeah, staying at home and self-isolating if you've been in contact with someone who tested positive is basically to help stop the spread. So um, if you're outside, you might sneeze and droplets of your sneeze or your cough will get to someone else's mouth and they'll get infected, you know. Um, but if you're within a very closed door, um, it's easier to manage. You know, healthcare workers can easily trace those you are in close contact with, test them and manage the situation. But if you go to the market, mosque, church, parties, everywhere, that's like a lot of people you're having contact with. And it becomes very difficult, you know, to trace them and to test them and we're spreading the virus that way. Now, you are a big advocate for uh, against gender-based violence and some of the reports we've seen in this uh, lockdown period all over the world suggest that there could be an increase in gender-based violence. Have you come across yes. any uh, conversations in that regard? Yes, we have um, because since COVID-19 we've been receiving like influx of cases of domestic violence. Um, there was a day we received 25 um, calls of domestic violence. We've been getting rape cases as well because um, people are now in close contact with their abusers. So there's high tendency for violence to occur within the home. Another thing is, I do understand that at some point you were uh, supposed to be scheduled to start a fantastic consultancy job and you were also expecting to sign a contract worth millions. You lost them all? Um, yes, because everything had a timeline for me to sign them. Um, but I couldn't sign them and it's fine, really. I'm just grateful to be alive and that's the most important thing for me. What for you would be um, the advice to government on how to handle this kind of uh, situation, especially uh, to at least encourage people to come forward? Because it would seem that many people uh, would rather just stay in their houses and lie about their ailments and, and refuse to come forward. How do you think the government can best uh, pull people forward to at least open up to their symptoms and testing? More awareness, basically, and providing support to people. Um, I mean, I've heard people who have lied about their travel history because of stigmatization of those who test positive. So government needs to do more in terms of, you know, creating awareness in this regard. And also we need to test more cases. Um, I believe that we should test more cases right now. Um, both those who are showing symptoms and those who are asymptomatic, it's important that we're able to test more people to get accurate data and then, you know, show, show the enormity of the virus in the country, which will help people then stay at home and take it seriously. But I think people are saying because, oh, we just have 200 cases. Oh, it's not a lot. You know, it's not that bad. But if we're testing more and getting more cases and, you know, showing statistics that, listen, it's not a joke, people will sit at home. And also, when we say sit at home, we also need to be able to provide help to those who are sitting at home. You know, for those who are like petty traders, those who have like small, you know, businesses, they need those daily income to survive. So government needs to support them at this time. 
All right, just before I let you go, I'd like to know, since you mentioned um, the need for testing, did any of your family members have to test for the virus since you tested positive? Yes, it was important for them to, um, to get tested and they're all fine. Nice. I'd like to say a very big thank you to you for finding time to come speak with us today. Oluwa Shion Oshowobi, thanks for speaking with us on Hard Copy today. Thank you very much for your time.